Hi everyone, my name is Matt Anderson. I'm a refinery process engineer and this is Corrosion in 5 Minutes. Before I hop into Corrosion, I just want to give a little bit of my background. So I have about four years experience as a practicing process engineer at an oil refinery and I've worked with our utility systems, so steam, sour water, uh, aiming systems, sulfur recovery. Uh, I've also worked with butane isomerization and I'm currently the primary engineer for our ALKI and FCC. And uh, my background with Corrosion is definitely not academic. I don't have a master's in corrosion or anything like that. I took one materials course as an undergraduate, but while working in industry, I've inspected a lot of vessels and I've worked on several or led several investigations that have been very corrosion dependent, very heavy in corrosion. So I've worked with several SMEs on the matter. And it's a topic I'm interested in, but it's also one I'd like to share a little bit that I've learned about just while I'm trying to get some general knowledge. So this short video is really for refinery engineers and but also undergraduates in college that are studying chemical engineering or uh, graduate school as well and maybe anyone who is supporting a refinery uh, whether it be operations or maintenance and i say it's in five minutes so don't start the clock yet i would start the clock right now i'm about to I'm about to start Okay, so first is what is corrosion? And this is when material degrades due to a chemical or physical reaction, and it often involves transfer of electrons. In fact, that's how I like to think about corrosion, is transfer of electrons. If you wanna learn about cathodes and anodes, uh, go to a different video or a different resource. I'm just gonna keep it really simple. And so water and oxygen can be problematic. Uh, what's interesting is that water, it conducts electricity very well, which can be useful, um, but corrosion is a lot about transfer of electrons so that makes water problematic. And uh, corrosion rates are typically measured in mils per year, and so one mil is equal to one one thousandth of an inch. It's kind of a metric unit within the customary system. Uh, so a couple important types of corrosion for refinery engineers are intergranular corrosion, pitting, hydrogen embrittlement, stress corrosion cracking, and fretting corrosion. So intergranular corrosion is when you have selective attack at metal grain boundaries. Uh, so inter, right, is between the boundaries, and the boundaries tend to be, can be more susceptible to corrosion than the insides. And this can occur after the metal has been heated, uh, for example, for welding, and that would be called weld decay. And a nice photo from Wikipedia showing you some uh, attack or cracking along those grain, metal grain boundaries. Pitting. Uh, I would say that pitting is probably the easiest type of corrosion to notice when you're actually inspecting a vessel. It can be pretty hard to miss if it's, if it's very severe. And so it's extremely localized corrosion that results in surface perforations that are definitely visible to the naked eye. And so you can have chlorides, fluorides, and thiosulfates in the presence of water. That can lead to pitting, and that's especially in stainless steel and aluminum alloys. There's that problematic water again. And hydrogen embrittlement, I broke it down into two subcategories. The first is when you have elevated temperature and high hydrogen partial pressure. When I think about that in a refinery context, I immediately think of hydro treating. And so this is in those uh, in that environment, you can have hydrogen diffused through carbon steel and react with carbon to generate methane. So that's going to remove the carbon, and that process is called decarburization. And decarburization that will result in loss of ductility and could result in metal failure due to cracking or blistering. Uh, second type of hydrogen embrittlement or context where it can occur is when you have the presence of H2S or HCN. In my experience, H2S is a lot more common. And so you can have atomic hydrogen, which penetrates carbon steel. And atomic hydrogen is really just a proton, right? Um, and so you have that atomic hydrogen penetrate carbon steel, when it, and then when it meets up with another atomic hydrogen, it can form molecular hydrogen. And the issue is, is that when it forms molecular hydrogen, it can actually will get stuck. It can no longer diffuse through the metal. And eventually, when you have enough of this molecular hydrogen forming, it can result in embrittlement, blistering, and cracking. And the example that I gave at a refinery would be your amine regenerator overhead. You definitely have a lot of H2S, a high H2S concentration, and that's a system. Stress corrosion cracking is cracking due to, sustain, due to sustained surface tensile strengths. And you can relieve it by using annealing heat treatment following welding. Uh, so if you think about it, if you weld a metal and then it heats up and then cools down, it can be left with kind of the metal almost pulling apart. And those stresses, they can be relieved by using uh, post-weld heat treatment, PWHT, which ends up removing those residual stresses and then you know mitigates the stress corrosion cracking from recurring on run. And this can be highly chemical specific, so you need to be careful about what alloy you're using and then what chemicals can end up causing that throughout the run as well. And an example is chlorides can cause SEC in some stainless steels and aluminum alloys. So chlorides have come up a couple times. Um, so maybe that list at the beginning where I said water and oxygen, watch out for. Another one would be chlorides, um, tend to cause quite a few problems with corrosion. And this is a nice picture. It's showing one of the common tests that's done, which is magnetic particle testing, MT. 
and you can see they, they put some magnetic particles on the surface of this um, uh, metal and they're able to detect some cracks that they would not be able to detect with just with your naked eye. Uh, I'd say the two most common tests for uh, this kind of cracking would be magnetic particle testing and then dye penetrant testing. Um, okay. Uh, the last type is fretting corrosion that I wanted to discuss, and this is the result of rubbing and sliding at contact surfaces. So this is an example of corrosion that does not involve transfer of electrons. And then if you want to, you know, let's learn a fancy word, something I just learned when I looked this up, is that fretting refers to wear and sometimes corrosion damage at the asperities of contact surfaces. I'm not sure if that's the right pronunciation, but that's definitely the right spelling. And fretting corrosion can be reduced by lubricating the rubbing surfaces, reducing vibrations and movements, or sealing the surfaces. And the picture I included with my uh, wonderful marked up red lines is of a, a flutter valve or a movable valve um, on, that's used in distillation towers. And when I was inspecting a tower that had these types of valves, there were many, many of the valves that had ridges worn through the tray where I'm showing with the red lines. And so what must have occurred during the course of the run is that the vibration of the flutter valve had slowly worn away and caused some grooves to form which caused that the flutter valves no longer would stay in place and we ended up having to replace the trays. At the time, I didn't know what the word was for this. I wasn't sure we called it erosion. It kind of seemed strange to me, but I've learned since that this would be considered fretting corrosion. Um, so then fretting is when you have, you're wearing away the surface due to those vibrations or rubbing motion. And then here's a few of my work cited. So I used, uh, you know, some Wikipedia sources and then also, of course, Perry's Chemical Engineering Handbook is great, and uh, Chemical Engineering Reference Manual as well is a good kind of quick guide to the different types of corrosion. So hopefully you learned something or, or liked this video, and I uh, hope it was useful for you, but thank you for watching.